Okay, uh, when we ended today, we ended with adjuvants, looking at adjuvants um, as uh, what their function are, function is. Their function is to increase uh, uh, the immune response that you'll see that, that will allow for greater chance that an antigen will elicit an immune reaction and increases its immunogenicity. Um, and as I as I said, there are <coughs> several examples of these. The two, when I, I sort of closed, I didn't have uh, um, my pen here. Uh, there are two here: Freud's adjuvant and uh, aluminum, aluminum adjuvant, other word, otherwise referred to as alums. Um, these are basically way if the antigen is basically solubilized in a kind of a a witch's brew, brew of, him, of mineral oil and some other things. And along the way, the adjuvant the, that's used is aluminum hydroxide plus the adjuvant. And these function to stimulate the inflammatory response in that area, it keeps the antigen kind of localized and recruit cells in them. And uh, we're learning a bit more about how they do this. Uh, uh, and it's, but it's, it's largely kind of a bit of a black box as to how these how these how these work. Um, to f suffice to say that I just wanted to let you know about these things that you that when you do have an antigen that you're trying to listen to immune response from, like for in a vaccine, <clears throat> it does have to be formulated um, to get the maximum immune re uh, immune reaction. Now let's take a look at we're going to take a look now at antibodies. Um, and so for the rest of this uh, s this online lecture uh, podcast, we're going to just take a look at the antibodies, describe them, and, and get to, to, to know them um, better. So uh, an antibody is, by definition, are protein molecules that bind specifically with antigens. And... What you'll find is, is is that antibodies, these are antibodies, antibodies are part of a large superfamily of proteins called immunoglobulins. Uh, it's a very large uh, family uh, and comprises a lot of proteins that, uh, most of the proteins that they comprise are proteins, the members of this family are proteins that are on the surfaces of cells or excreted. Uh, they're very tough proteins and you can see here you'll see there uh, there is a um, abbreviation form IGs so immunoglobulins is shortened down to IGs um, and antibodies are just part of that superfamily that receptor superfamily um, uh, and we're going to see some other members of that family later which are going to come up in other as as other immune molecules now there are five <coughs> classes of antibodies. Um, these classes are designated uh, G, M, A, D, and E, and so you'll see this that uh, the the nomenclature, um, and there's no real reason why there is this nomenclature. I have no idea, but uh, suffice it to say that there's uh, I, G, G, I, G, M, I, G, A, I, G, D, and I, G, E, and these are each of those are immunoglobulin G, immunoglobulin M, immunoglobulin, um, um, immunoglobulin M, immunoglobulin A, immunoglobulin D, immunoglobulin E. There are also several subclasses, so these are the classes. The subclasses are referred to with a num with numerically with a with either a one, two, three, and four. And so there would be IgG one, IgG two, IgG three, for example, and IgG four. And uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Depending on the subclass, um, they'll have different, uh, potentially different functions, uh, a bit different functions, um, uh, as we'll see. And so IgA has two subclasses, IgD has two, whereas IgG have four. Now, if we look at an antibody structure, that structure uh, is comprised of, com is made up of um, uh, two uh, 
two primary chains, polypeptide chains, one in blue here which is referred to as the heavy chain because it's the largest chain. Um, if we precipitated out and ran that on a column it would be the one that would be um, we would see would, would run on a gel at the top. Whereas there's a lighter chain that the, in pink here there's a there's a chain that's referred to as the pink as a light chain. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, and and it's called the light chain because of course it's smaller. It has only two big big units. Now they each are uh, composed of domains and so if we look at for example one of these light chains over here okay we would see that the light chain has two domains one of those is referred to as a variable region uh, and another chain is referred another domain is referred to as a constant region and it is the variable regions that are going to we're really going to be the most interested in because it's the variable regions that uh, bind to the antigen. Now in the variable region here there are a series of loops uh, that comprise the um, the interactions uh, uh, and form the pocket that is going to bind to the antigen. And there's three loops in the light chain. There are each of the chains, each chain, each chain uh, carries with it three of those three of those loops. Now if we go over to a heavy chain we'll see it also has a variable region too just like the light chain and it also contains three loops so that the entire binding site is composed of we'll see later if I was to bind an antigen it would interact with if I can draw this if I was to bind an antigen it would interact with six, it potentially interact with six loops. Okay, so those loops are referred to as hypervariable loops, and there's three from the light chain and there's three from the heavy chain, composing uh, uh, so that they're comprised of six. The binding pocket is comprised of six loops. Now, if we look at the light chain <clears throat> further down, we see that it has a constant region here. It also, in that constant region, is hooked to the other, con the constant region of the light chain, heavy chain and the light chain, are essentially stapled together by a disulfide bond. That disulfide bond is a covalent bond, so it means that these are covalently linked. Okay, So therefore, they, um, when they form, they are extremely, it's a very stable set of interactions between them. Uh, it's very stable anyway. But putting this uh, disulfide in there really nails the nails them shut. There are disulfides actually that are in each one of these loop in each one of these domains and the domains that you have here, and they further stabilize uh, the uh, interact stabilize the um, stabilize the domain so that they become so that because uh, because you want to have antibodies have to exist. Uh, in the proteins in the serum, they can be excreted into uh, the GI tract, in the respiratory tract, they can ex be excreted in, the, in sweat. So they need to be able to be in a lot of different, <coughs> sorry, um, they have to be able to survive in a lot of different environments, tough environments, and so they need to, they can, you don't want these molecules to unfold. Uh, under those under environments in which you, a normal uh, sort of a typical protein would, so either they need to be in areas where there's high temperature, high pH, high or low pH, um, uh, varieties of different different environments, and so that's what to make them more stable. So these disulfides ensure that they are more stable. Um, there's a hinge region, as you can see here. There's a there's a bit of there's a region referred to as the hinge region, and then the um, <clears throat> and then the uh, the light the heavy chain um, has two additional for an IgG has two additional constant regions and so these are referred to as constant region one constant region two and constant region three these two chains the chain the two heavy chains are held together by uh, disulfide bonds and the number of these disulfide bonds that are particularly um, 
uh, between that a, a particular heavy chain will have for a particular sub for a particular class might be different but they do but they'll but you'll see they'll have but these are always there and they go and they're in place there to hold the two to nail these two chains uh, together so there's a hinge region which allows for flexibility and then there is another region for uh, constant region where there are this this part is con this constant region. Now this is referred to as fragment constant region because this area um, is a ligand that can bind to a receptors and those receptors on cells as we're going to see there are receptors on cells for um, for the uh, FC region in order to recognize and bind to the and bind to them and we'll see why that's important later but that recognition is really important. Um, so just to recap, there's uh, three uh, variable hypervariable loops uh, per chain, uh, comprising six, comprising six per side, per arm. So this arm has six, and then on this side there's another six. So each of the an antibody has two binding sites. That means it's bivalent. It has two uh, two sites. In which it can bind, and when it binds, it, each these sites are identical. Okay, so these site is identical to that site, and so they can bind the antigen, the antigen and determinant, the epitope. These both bind the same uh, epitope and antigen and determinant. <clears throat> now, if we look at um, if we look at an antibody, um, uh, if we if we we look at it we will notice we look at the structure what we find is what we what we would find is is that an antibody is composed of you notice beta sheets so this green if we look at this green heavy chain or light chain what we see is that the, that each of those domains that variable region which is up here uh, in this constant region for this green light chain uh, is composed of beta sheets now beta sheet structure is really critical because of all the secondary structures um, that you find in protein productions, beta sheets are the ones that are the most stable. They're more, far more stable than alpha helices and uh, loops. And so you'll see if you have a protein or receptor that needs to be on the outside of a cell or needs to be excreted, it's probably going to have beta. Uh, it's going to have a significant amount of beta sheet structure, and these do. Now, as you can see here, there looks like these these loops. We'll focus on those later. But you can see there's a heavy chain. Uh, there, the heavy chain is the one in tan, and the one in um, um, in red, and they're identical. You can see in this X-ray in this X-ray structure. I just have them colored differently so you can see them, but they're identical. You can see the right the um, you can see the loop regions right there or, or the hinge region right here so there's a hinge region here so it gives the molecule flexibility it can move around and then you'll notice uh, if I stop right there you can see the FC region it's I drew it flat but in fact it has a bent kind of this bent conformation in order to bind which it will bind the um, um, it's it's the receptor the other thing you notice about these molecules is they tend to be pretty flat uh, and so if we look here, if we look, if we let this thing rotate and we stop it here, you can see how flat it actually is rather flat. It's rather flat. So the binding binds to the, the binding regions bind to the antigen up here. Okay. So now let's take a look at, um, so to make sure we understand how they bind. So if we have a foreign cell surface, it's an antibody surface. Uh, and there's a surface antigen and an antibody we have an antibody that binds to that antigen then that antibody is going to be able because it's bivalent is going to be able to go and bind to two antigens because it can recognize two antigen determinants simultaneously and so therefore <clears throat> uh, therefore the anti an antibody is by definition uh, in its simplest form is bivalent and can do that. Now why is that important? Well one of the reasons it's important is because just as if you if you grab onto something with one hand or grab onto it with two hands, if you grab onto it with two hands you're going to hold stronger, it's going to be a stronger effect then you're going to have more strongly be able to hold onto it than if you grab onto it with one hand. 
so that's true at the molecular level too when you have two when you have an antibody it has two grasping hands can bind onto two antigens and hold on tightly that is referred to as avidity an avidity effect a v i d i t y avidity avidity effect and so the avidity of antibodies is quite is can be quite high as we'll see so they have, they take advantage of that and in particular if one of these if it sort of dissociates here uh, if this were to come apart from this antigen then this one is already is going to be attached and so and then it'll and then it can rebind so that avidity effect is because you hold um, when you have one uh, thing bound here then the ability for this to bind uh, bind to that antigen uh, at that epitope is is much 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 greater because the effect of molarity has been increased um, so substantially so bivalent and high avidity now <clears throat> you can manipulate antibodies and it was found that you can manipulate antibodies uh, by using proteolysis um, and examine them and study their functions and even usually potentially use them as drugs so for example if we proteolyze it turns out papain cleaves right um, at the uh, hinge region and it cleaves such that it it destroys those disul there's a disulfide bonds are cleaved and what it rele what it releases is the two arms and then the FC region now what these are called are these are called fragment antibodies so these single arms of an antibody are referred to as fab fragments those single arms are fab fragments now you can then isolate those and then you would have a protein that would bind specifically to one epitope on an antigen monovalently okay and so those for some in some cases therapeutically um, you want to have that in other cases you don't now you can also uh, proteolize with pepsin and pepsin will essentially destroy uh, the FC region but leave uh, but leave the antibody bival the bivalent the the hooks uh, the staples the disulfide bonds between the hinge regions intact such that you have a bivalent um, bivalent binding protein it's referred to as a fab 2 prime and that does not have the FC region so its ability to bind to an antigen or a couple of antigens is the same its avidity is the same but what is removed is it can't interact with cells. It can't interact with the cell receptors, the FC receptors, and so you've removed that. And for some applications, you would like to have that. So you can manipulate antibodies using these two prote uh, proteases, papain and pepsin, to manipulate them and, and isolate uh, different structures. Now, um, if we look at the antibody structures, um, a little bit more closely uh, the structure itself the G A M D and E is all based on the heavy chain so the heavy chain uh, as for a F I G G is gamma for I G A is alpha and I G I G M is mu I G D is D and I G E is epsilon so these are the different heavy chains that are available the light chains come in two flavors, kappa and lambda, and uh, uh, actually depending on uh, the mammal, they may have more kappas than lambdas. But these are two different these are two different types of light chains that can uh, that can be um, uh, can be available. And so for the light chain, a light chain has a heavy ch have a, has a constant region and a variable region, VL and CL. Uh, for a heavy chain, um, then you have one variable region, and for an IgG, you would have three constant regions. So this would comprise the gamma chain. So again, IgG, the, the way you define how the, the letter is refined, G, A, M, D, or E, is defined by the uh, sequence of the composition of the heavy chain. Is it gamma, alpha? A mu delta or epsilon so if we look at if we look at those uh, a little bit more closely what we find is is that um, for IgG for example and it has three constant regions in its heavy chain and it's um, uh, gamma heavy chain 
uh, for mu for the IgM it actually has four constant regions in its heavy chain uh, for uh, IgD it has three constant regions the sequence of these is going to be different for D and G so they're total they're different sequences for IgA you have three again and for IgE you have four again again different sequences you'll notice these little green uh, sort of like diamond shapes on here uh, this is to to remind me to and, and, and for you to understand that antibodies uh, are glycosylated when they're produced and these are like these are sites of glycosylation and they can have they can have effects on their function their elimination from the bloodstream their ability to be retained uh, there's a variety of different functions that they um, that they can have uh, and you can also manipulate and you'll notice that the, the degree of glycosylation can be very different across the different proteins so for example in IgA there's lots of glycosylation on the um, on the um, alpha chain the heavy chain um, of uh, IgA up near the uh, its first constant region whereas there's no glycosylation uh, on the IgG so they're very they have different these differ uh, from antibody to antibody and uh, largely these are all uh, on the heavy chain as you can see. Now if we look at an antibody a little closer its interaction with a um, its interaction with a, um, a antigen and the antigen determinant what we find is is that if you look at this you can see here this is a this would be a heavy and a light chain come together we're just looking at a fab fragment here and it's binding in this case it's binding lysozyme and uh, when it does that uh, it forms a very nice um, let me just get this here. Pen. It forms a very nice uh, uh, complementary um, set of interactions with the um, antigen, the antigen determinant of the pro of the lice of the protein. So this is a really good example. It shows you binding it. This is the pocket that's binding uh, the lysozyme. It's binding its um, the antigen determinant. And if we pull them apart, what we'd find is that there, we'll see that there are parts that were particularly interesting that were we couldn't see, right? We couldn't see this red, uh, this red um, amino acid side chain. It was occluded. It was deep. It was buried within that pocket. If we turn them then uh, um, 90 degrees facing us. And we looked at the at the places in which the interactions uh, and mapped the interactions between them. What we find is is that on the on the um, antigen, there is there is basically a pocket or an area of the of the antigen which is is going to be comprised the antigen determinant. It might be they might those uh, antigen determinants might be all in one um, one area. They might also comprise areas that are a little bit outside of the area. If we look at those, these are the interactions on the antibody that are in the variable regions that interact with the antigen determinant on the, on the antigen lysozyme. And you can see there are several of those. Some of them you are on the periphery and some of them are actually in the um, very close to the center. Okay. If we take away the um, space filling um, representation of the side chains and we just look at the at the car at the backbone uh, of the molecule uh, what we look at is we could now see those loops uh, we could see the we could see the loops the sort of the skeleton by seeing the loops and what we find is is that each the heavy chain the light chain again remind you contain three of these loops so if we were to look at say the heavy chain here we'd find that there are one and they're denoted heavy chain uh, H1, H2, and H3 that refers to loop 1, loop 2, and loop 3. And the CDR, the term CDR refers to complementary determining region. That's complementary determining region. And so that region, that, that CDR H1 is another way of saying loop 1, okay, of heavy chain. So there's three from um, the heavy chain. There's also three from the light chain. And you'll notice, very interestingly, in each case, the heavy chain and the light chain, um, 
in this case CDRL3 which would be the light chain loop 3 the CDR3 each case the uh, CDR3 these to the the third the and, and uh, CDR3 CRH3 and CRL3 the third loop are all in the center comprise the center of the um, of the antigen binding region This turns out to be really important because a great deal of the interactions with the antigen determinant uh, occur between uh, occur between interactions with these two loops. Then there's the two other peripheral loops, uh, L, um, the second one and the first one, CDRH2, CDRL2, CDRH1, CDRL1, and those will form interactions around along. Um, um, also with the antigen and determinant and the antigen. But I just want to point out the, CD, the, the CDR3s threes are, are um, of, of, if you rank them, typically are the most important in the binding interactions. And here you can sort of see um, a little bit differently in which you can see there's the CDR3s. Notice they're right in the middle, all right? And so you can see that right here. Whereas the other two uh, CDRs, one and two, from each of those change, chains are on the periphery or binding, uh, binding outside of that of the site by, bound by the um, CDR um, CDR threes. Take a look at that again. So you can see the, the these loops are much more uh, further out, and in fact, uh, only maybe part of those loops, uh, part of these loops, are important whereas much more substantially areas of the CDR3 are important. This sort of also gives you, uh, when you look at this, you can really see the beta sheet structure, this really uh, rigid beta sheet structure between them that comprise an antibody. And this is just another example of just looking at one chain. You can see, right, if I stop it here, there's CDR3. CDR2, CDR1, and you can see um, CDR, uh, CDR3 really is, uh, is, is positioned in the center of that binding pocket. Now, uh, antibodies have that binding pocket has the ability to uh, change or be designed or to be evolved in design, uh, selected for. Uh, to bind a variety of different antigens. It can bind, for example, in this case, what we see here is what's referred to as a, as a very sharp or uh, distinct antigen determinant in which, it, in which there's going to be deep binding within the pocket. Uh, it can also bind uh, uh, antigen determinants that are loops or have a longer structure across the uh, that uh, across the, uh, as you can see here, right here, across the, the whole um, uh, antibody binding pocket. And it can have even more flatter, uh, less concave uh, antibodies, uh, which they can bind more flat structures like this, in which uh, the structure will be less, con you know, um, less concave and have a, a bit of a flatter structure. So the important thing here is the loops actually at the bottoms of those loops are areas in which that are conserved which can tweak the conformation such that you can change the conformations of the loops in a variety of different ways to create really sort of concave uh, deep pockets as well as flat pockets to allow for maximum interaction with the, the and, and uh, maximized interaction with the antigen. Now uh, when you're talking about an epitope, an antigen determinant, which is the antigen determinant, there you can classify those as in two ways. One of those would be as a linear epitope, and what that means is is that it binds the the antigen determinant actually is comprised of a linear arrangement of the amino acid. In other words, one right after the other. So, for example, in this case, here's your protein. This antigen is binding uh, these three amino acids. Uh, and it's binding, it's binding them, it's, it's, the antibody's binding and it's antigen determinant and they're, and they're one right after the other. They've, they're connected, physically connected. 
Now you can have what we call it as discontinuous epitopes, and those are ones in which it can it will bind to the the um, chemical structure, uh, the 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 the, uh, the amino acid residues that have been put forward and that it sees and able to bind to, but they may be not actually connected, but because of the folding of the protein, it can fold up and present that surface to the cell, present that surface to the antibody. Um, it can present that and uh, because of its folded structure. And so, for example, if I were to cut this protein here uh, and then uh, maybe allow and then add it, you know, add it back in, uh, it would be much weaker, weak, weaker binding because it could only bind half of that, pro, half of the, um, um, it could only bind half, um, only only half of the of the of the antigenic terminant would be available. Okay, so in this case, this is referred to as a discontinuous one. Um, in this case, this is a linear one. So if I cut this protein in half, this antibody can still bind the half of the protein fine. It will have the same fit. It will have the same ability to bind it. But if I cut this protein in half, it's not going to be able to bind the protein with the same affinity because half of it, uh, half of it, uh, is not connect is not connected to the other one. Now uh, there is a thing called the B cell receptor. So on B cells, just, this is just to show you that on B cells, which uh, in which you will find antibodies, we're going to learn later. Uh, there are receptors uh, f that will bind the antibodies that allow it to um, uh, sense the, the B cell to sense where the antigen is. Um, and there's, so these are referred, these are B cell, this is called a B cell receptor, but these are really FC receptors too. And so I just wanted to point out these, these regions are, there are, there, there are receptors on the surfaces of cells um, that will bind to the FC uh, will bind to the FC region, and that FC region uh, uh, is important because it by it will bind to these receptors and governs the interaction of cells. And we're going to see that why that's important in a little bit. But for now, what I'd like you to do is is take the there's here's a, a three review questions. You want to stop here. Um, see if you can answer the review questions. You can just stop the tape, stop the um, video and answer those. And the next, uh, the next slide will have the answers to them. So for now, uh, this will end this uh, segment uh, on the structure of antibodies. And um, I'll have the next segment up uh, relatively soon.